Okay. I'm going to turn this guy on. So I'm like all wired up here. If at any point anyone can't hear me, just holler. Uh, let's do this. Cool. So before we get started, I have two confessions to make. One is that I really only came here because I wanted an excuse to have a title of a talk that had the word damn it in it. Uh, and two, I come from the like environmental and activist community, and I'm not accustomed to being in a room this big. I like sit in small rooms where people get close together and feelings are on the table. <laughs> so you all feel really far away right now. Um, so now that those are out of the way, uh, my name is Penny, and I work at this place over here in Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, and I'm also the ED of a wee tiny startup called Confluvium. And our mission is to visually map out structured and unstructured data to help people better understand the way countries share rivers that cross borders. So if anybody's into water, please come chat. Um, so, where's my thing here? Uh, today, we're here to talk about how and why you would want to survive exposing your soft underbelly, and that is being a beginner. Is anybody in here, does anybody consider themselves a beginner in anything? Yeah. So it doesn't have to be this, it could be anything. Yeah. Is anybody here because they want to activate beginners? Cool. OK, good. Excellent. Um, I kind of think about being a beginner kind of the way I would think about being in a 12-step program. And the first of those steps is uh, it's not easy, and that's OK. Uh, it's like, hi, I'm Penny. I'm a beginner. <laughs> I started coding when I was. 32. <laughs> um, so I guess what we're here to talk about is why are we going to push on when being a beginner makes us feel so vulnerable? And the reason is there are stories out there that are too important not to tell. Uh, so I have something very, very important to tell you. And that is the lower Seisan Dam off of the Mekong River will not hold back the flood. For now, that's all the context you're going to need, OK? So dams are often sold as a flood control mechanism. And this isn't a new idea. They have been using dams on the Mekong for centuries as a way of regulating the flow. But the scale to which we can build these dams now is far, far greater than ever before. Um, so if the dam will not hold back the flood, how did we reach this conclusion? Uh, so the International Center for Environmental Management, the company that I work at, conducted a study of 67 dams on tributaries of the Mekong River. And they studied those dams for five different indicators, the most important of which uh, were natural flood threat, flood impact potential, and flood control. Okay, those are the three to remember. Uh, so after months of pouring over literature, conducting studies, rain gauges, the end result was the lower Seisan will not hold back the flood. So if this is such an important story, why is it that you haven't heard it yet? And that's because more often than not, history is being written by the wrong people, right? So dams, uh, beyond hydropower, dams are sites of power, other kinds of power. Uh, beyond the concrete and the turbines, these are about social and ecological justice. Uh, the Lower Seisan, much like most of the dams in the region, is a battle between the powerful and the less so. Uh, the powerful are the ones who are making the decisions, and the less so are the ones who inevitably wind up living through those decisions. Uh, so dams are often framed as a technological necessity meant to compensate for an economic need. We're dealing with places like Vietnam and Laos, where you know, the, the common line is economies are growing, population is growing. In order to feed people, everybody needs electricity. You know, two plus two equals more dams, right? Uh, but these, uh, every dam carries its own story. 
And most often the stories that wind up making it out into the world are those who are being, like, they're, folks, they're being told by folks with an agenda. Uh, so counter stories, like this one, are wonderfully disruptive. And this is why it's so important that you're here. I have something to tell you. And that is, you also have something to say, right? And if you're anything like me, you are probably having some of the same doubts that I and everybody in this room is having. And that is, like, who am I? I don't have anything to say. I'm not an expert. I don't have the skills. I didn't go to school for this. I haven't been coding in my parents' basement since I was 13. You know, who am I to be able to do this? And the answer is you're here, and that's, a, that's enough. That's all it takes, really. Um, in some cases, those doubts are legitimate. We have to understand that like, we come from particular histories, particular, particular identities, and in some respects, you will have to take either a collaborative or a supportive approach in your storytelling. And, and that's really important. But it doesn't negate the fact that there are stories in you and in the world that you are itching to tell. And if you're anything like me, you're going to want to tell it in a map, right? So my own example, uh, this all started in 2013, so about a year and a half ago. I had taken a few web development courses in my undergrad in 2006. So I had a basic understanding of HTML, CSS, and absolutely zero JavaScript. I got into this and was like, jQuery what? Huh? Um, so there was obviously a serious gap in my, in my own knowledge. Um, so I started to skill myself up. I made a few maps using open data. Uh, is anybody here? Is everybody here from the States? No, no Kanakistanis? OK. I'm from, I'm from Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and the province of Ontario, where I come from, is, has started releasing open data, uh, which is, I mean, some of it's really goofy. Some of it's like uh, the most popular baby names in the province, which is wholly unuseful. But what they did release was the entire history of the permits to take water in Ontario. You need a permit in order to remove more than 50,000 liters a day of water from the groundwater supply in the province. And when you're dealing with things like bottled water or groundwater supplies or like the city of Guelph, which suddenly ran out of water, this becomes really important. And mapping it got very cool. So that was one of the things that I just sort of started to build myself up using. And also, I coded this ridiculous 10,000 line KML of the Indus River, uh, mainly because uh, it was my master's degree. I had a lot of time, and I thought I was a baller. Um, and it w wound up going really well, except for my wife says that the only time she hears me yell is when I'm working on these projects. <laughs> um, so now in the real world, it's 2013, and I had received a contract to create a map that would allow things like highlight on mouse over, uh, embedded tooltips, and other goodies that at the time I had absolutely no idea how to build. So on the one hand, I was like, yes. And on the other hand, I was more frightened than I had ever been in my life. <laughs> and that's OK. <laughs> so uh, the other really important thing that the map had to be able to do was change the color of the dam. So all of these sort of multicolor yellow to red spectrum. These are all the dams that ISEM had studied and that they had developed these indicators for. So the map had to be able to change the color of the dams to reflect the legend whenever the user clicked on these really awkwardly placed buttons that I made. So remember this, because this gets more important later on. So my new employers, who were incidentally on the other side of the world, 
proudly shipped me a bunch of what I assume were gorgeous MXD files and sent me on my way. Uh, I had a Macintosh and a $1,300 budget and absolutely no idea how to open an MXD file. I searched and searched and searched. I tried Google Earth Pro. I tried everything. And after, you know, I don't even want to admit how long, I finally emailed my employer because I didn't want to admit to them, hey guys, you know, you gave me this contract and I'm an utter beginner and you gave me this contract because you don't have a budget and I don't have a budget and I smiled and you trust me and that's awesome. But I can't open these. I really can't. So they finally, after some negotiation, they sent me some shape files, at which point I had to once again confront my beginnerness. So the first things that I learned in this process, what you build doesn't have to be perfect. Someone is always going to see the flaws, and that's OK. You don't have to be an expert. Again, someone will see the flaws. Someone's going to stand there and go, but what about the data? And that's OK, because the more you talk these things through, the more you're going to improve. And again, it's exposing that soft underbelly, and it feels awkward, and none of us like it. But it's the only thing that's going to help you improve. The other thing I learned is that you can do a hell of a lot with the basics. <laughs> um, so for this project in particular, uh, so for the nested catchments, where are we? <laughs> Awkward. Anyway, so for the nested catchments, these are the catchments that feed the rivers that are held back by the dams. So for the nested catchments, all I did was I had this shape file, and I figured out how to import it into PostGIS. And all it was was creating a view and order by. So all I had to learn was import the shape file, select everything in the table, create a view, order by size. And all of a sudden, I could visualize these nested catchments that had shown up originally with all of the big ones on top. So if you moused over, all you got was the big one, and there was nothing underneath. So three things, and suddenly I had nested catchments. Um, uh, for the dams and the way they could change color, originally I got this file, I got, I got tables, just like Excel spreadsheets, and it was one table per indicator. So there's five indicators, I had five tables. So I created a CSV, and had a new column for every indicator, so that as you went across the dam, you had all of that dam's information. And then to get the, 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 the point data, what I did was I created my Excel sheet. Actually, no, I used NeoOffice, so more open source. Um, and then I copied and pasted the point data from the attribute table in QGIS and pasted it into my Excel sheet. Like, we're, t we're not talking anything super high tech here. Uh, and then Leaflet, basic, really basic interactivity is so well documented in Leaflet, Mapbox, all of this. Like, it's, it, th they're all generally first level skills. So, before you get started with all of these tools, all of this is story. It's all narrative. And before you get started with the tools, you have to know what your story is. Um, if you're getting lost, if you're getting frustrated with technology that you've never encountered before, it might be not the technology you're having trouble with, but the fact that you don't really know what you want to say yet. And so what I would tell you to do is storyboard your map the way you would a video. Have it all laid out so that you have a concise set of steps where if you're getting lost over here, you can come back to your storyboard and remind yourself of where you are, what you want to say, and how you want to say it, right? And make sure that the interactivity that you're choosing always supports your story because, I mean, the whiz bang stuff might look really cool and it might be super satisfying when you get it to work. But if it's distracting from your story, cut it. Cut it. Next, cut, cut. And it's going to ultimately save you time as well. Um, so for this, for, for my map, the story for my map, 
The obvious things were the dams. But moreover, these little green worms here, this is the, uh-oh. Oh no, my RoboCop, where did you go? There we go. These little green worms here are actually like the five kilometer blast radius. So if a dam were to breach, this would be the most immediately affected area. So beyond just the dams and the nested catchments, we wanted to capture who would be impacted first and most if that dam were to fail. So here you can see that below this particular dam, it's the Seisan 4A, there are 5,000 people living in the blast radius, right? 2,000, almost 2,000 of which are under the poverty line. So beyond just the technicalities of our indicators and our nested catchments and the dams themselves, we wanted to humanize this a little bit and show exactly who would be most immediately impacted by the impacts on these dams. So the next thing to know is that it's the data that makes all of this possible. This particular data was begging to be mapped. I got handed a stack of tables that were so thoroughly researched. Absolutely wonderful. But this is like particularly spatially important. This was begging, begging to be mapped. And there are so, there's so much of it out there. It's not just this, like there's acres of, of, of story and data that is absolutely begging to be mapped. And there are brilliant people creating maps. They're crunching data. They're doing important work. But there aren't enough. There aren't enough of us. Um, be warned, data is never innocent, ever. It may feel objective, but what you choose to collect, how you choose to present it, is all contingent upon your own experiences and your own sort of location in the globe. Um, and that's OK. But you have to be aware of it. You have to allow that position to inform how and what you do with that data. Okay? Good data takes a lot of work. Uh, so for this map, it was like months and months of study and rain gauges and interviews with people on the ground. And all of that produced this. And this, I mean, from the outset, it looks like not a lot. But I, I, I kind of think of it the way you would watch a figure skater. You see a figure skater on the ice in the Olympics do a triple axel or whatever, and it looks effortless. And you have no idea the number of 4 AM mornings that went into like years and years of like labor and passion and sacrifice. Good data is kind of the same way. You have to work really, really hard to make it look that effortless. Okay. Um, good data also motivates. If you're encountering all of this like, technology you've never seen before, and you're bashing your head against the wall, going back, almost like going back to your storyboard, going back to your data will help you locate yourself. It'll help you be like, right, this is what I actually came here to do. I didn't come here to fight with curly braces. I actually came here to, to map and tell the story. So lessons. This will take more time than you think it will, <laughs> always. <laughs> and again, that's OK. <laughs> um, so now you have a story. You want to map it. What next? The secret to the next step is always time and attention, right? Everything is going to look complicated at first. You're going to open up a tutorial, and it's going to look like pass the argument through the flux capacitor over to your mom, and magic happens, and ta-da! It's going to look impossible. And that's OK, <laughs> because time and attention is going to help you unpack the things you don't yet understand. Uh, this, is, this is my strategy. Try, try. Try again, try again, take a break, right? No matter how awesome you think you are, your precious brain is going to run out of juice, and you are going to need to take a step back. 
okay? Uh, when you feel your, yourself hitting the wall, walk away from it. Use my strategy. I prefer wine. <laughs> wine works for me. Uh, I also carry an unlimited supply of chocolate. Thank you, gift shop. <laughs> But if you know, if you're maybe slightly healthier than I am, go for a bike ride. Or if TV is your thing, like sit down and watch an episode of The Simpsons. Laugh at something completely inane and then go back because fresh eyes are a miracle. Uh, the next thing, read the tutorials. Read them again <laughs> and again and again and again. Um, every time you read it, you will find something you missed on the first try. Or if you've read it, gone back to your problem, crunched through some stuff, and you're still having trouble, you come back to that tutorial and you will have extra experience that will allow you to find the detail that you missed the first six times. Um, write down the contact information of the friend who knows more than you do. <laughs> okay? Or in my case, the Mapbox support team. Uh, so, in practice, what this looks like is there's a spectrum, right? There's one side of the spectrum that's like, I've tried nothing and I've run out of ideas, uh, which is never good. And then there's the other side of the spectrum where you've been smashing your head against the wall for hours, right? And somewhere along that line between I've tried nothing and, you know, brain cavity, you're going to call your friend or you're gonna send an email to that help box, um, and after they've pulled your broken, sobbing ass out of the fire, you're going to buy them a beer, <laughs> okay? Um, save everything, save it, save it all. Um, bookmark pages with good hints or that have helped you solve problems that you didn't know you had. Um, save every iteration of your project, date and time it, and save it in a folder called archive. Save scribbled ideas on napkins, save mind maps, save every storyboard, every diagram, save it like a bad episode of Hoarders because you never know when this is gonna come in handy. You're gonna erase something, I do this all the time. I did this last week before I emailed Duncan at the Mapbox help thing and I was like, I had it, I had it working and then I erased it and I didn't save it and you, you will trip over this okay, all the time and it's okay, again, that's okay, but save it. Um, console is your friend. You will curse and swear at console's error messages. There will be much gnashing of teeth over, you know, mismatched curly braces. That's okay. <laughs> Make friends with console. Um, and also, really, really important, and it's only for the project, I promise you can go back to it after, you're going to turn off Twitter. Okay? Twitter is the land of things I don't know how to do yet. And it's really exciting. And at the beginning, seeing all of those things that are like, oh my god, I can 3D time lapse uh, my neighbor's backyard. Oh my god, I can do that. But you can't yet. It eventually gets really distracting and overwhelming. And you'll start to feel like, I am never, ever, ever going to be able to do this. That's why you're going to turn off Twitter. You can turn it on later, it's okay, but right now you're going to turn that off, okay? Um, so with that strategy in mind, you've got your story, you've got a bit of skill under your belt, and then you're going to need to know how to get the job done. So what's your stack? Do you know what a stack is yet? If you don't, that's okay. And the stack part goes a bit back to the land of things I don't know how to do yet. This is another part that could feel super overwhelming. I used to have a slide for another one, and I should have put it in here, with the logos of the umpteen million different things you can use to map. Some of them you have to pay money for, some of them are free, some of them are open source, some of them are you know, ArcGIS and you have to give up a month's pay. Uh, but like, they're like, but you can do this. <laughs> And it's going to feel super overwhelming. So cut, cut the things you, you don't think you're going to need. Like, if all you need to do is run through like, some straight shape files through tile mill and get that ish on the web, just do it. Right? Don't worry about the rest of it this time. Uh, pair, pair back. And it's almost like your story. You're going to storyboard your stack. 
get to know it, get to know it well, right? Um, make sure it's open source. <laughs> Uh, that's all what we're here to do. I feel like maybe I'm already preaching to the choir, but seriously, um, do you have a budget? Can you afford to pay for stuff? If so, donate to the open source people who are building your stack, right? Contribute to the community. Um, so once you've got your stack going, the how-to, here are the other things that I came to after a long, long period of bashing my head against the wall. Start by just getting a map on your screen. Start with this one accomplishable task, because the moment you get that thing on the screen, you're going to feel amazing, and it's going to motivate you to keep coming back for more. Don't go like, I'm going to get all of this on the screen. Just a map, just one. Okay. Here, here's my favorite, <laughs> my favorite lesson of all. You're going to Frankenstein that shit. You're just, you are going to make the monster, right? Uh, in no case will one tutorial give you everything you need. So you are going to pick the pieces from each tutorial that you read, and you're going to mash them all together, right? Um, for, for my map, for this guy, most of this came from uh, one Choropleth tutorial on the Leaflet website. It gave me uh, the hover. It gave me styles. Where's my cursor? <laughs> Crap. There we go. It gave me embedded tooltips. It gave me all kinds of really magnificent stuff that I needed. But it didn't give me everything, particularly when it came to having an obsessive desire to not use markers, but instead use circles for the dams, um, which meant that I had to start Frankensteining stuff. And that was when I got into Stack Exchange. Good Lord, if I could buy Stack Exchange as an entity, a beer, you bet I, I would do it. Um, because ostensibly, if you have created your story and you've started to build your map, you're already coming up with questions. You're running into specific problems. Okay? You're going to take that problem, and you're going to Google it. And don't feel like that makes you any less of a coder, remote sensor, anything. Because guess what? We all Google it. <laughs> Everybody. Um, so for this problem, I had gotten all of the color values embedded in GeoJSON from the Choropleth tutorial. Uh, Stack Exchange and Leaflet had given me the bits that I needed to apply that to a circle marker rather than a polygon. Uh, I'd even found answers that explained how I could add a button to my page that would allow the user to, to change which uh, column in the GeoJSON the browser would look to in order to get the color. Um, and I thought that was enough. And it was like, OK, cool, I'm just going to press the button. It's going to change the column, find the value, change the color. Amazing, right? No. <laughs> it was just like snag, snag, snag. Nothing was working, um, which is why I tell everyone to find four answers to every question you have. And I mean, it doesn't have to be four. It could be six. It could be two. Find multiple, because one of them, like some of them are going to be off track from what you need. Others, which I found, are going to be wildly above your skill set. That's the like flux capacitor action that you're not going to get. And that's OK. They can talk to each other, because someone is going to explain the answer to your question in a language that you do understand. You just have to have the patience and the persistence to find it. Um, cool. So we found the answers to the problems that we're having. We have our map. We have our storyboard. And then, hopefully, if all goes well, we have the aha moment. So in my case, the aha moment was the color of a dam. And it was that moment that everybody hopes to get when they get a new data set and they want to make it, they want to map it. And they want to take that aha moment, and they want to share it with everybody else, right? Because there's, I mean, there's a personal satisfaction in being able to map it and have that moment of like, yes, 
But when you get to actually share that with other people, that's the whole purpose of this exercise. Uh-oh. Oh, God, i got to talk faster. <laughs> um, so for mine, if we go back to the lower Seisan will not hold back the flood. Where are you, buddy? Here is my lower Seisan dam. Right? This guy. So we've kind of gone over nested catchments. So if you can see, we have all of these nested catchments whoop, that all flow down into this one teeny tiny space, right? Lower Say Sand Dam, being sold as flood control. So right now, if we look at the legend, we can see that it doesn't have a whole lot of capacity when it comes to uh, flood control. But you know, like its buddies around here, they don't look that great either. So if we're all underperforming, like what's the problem, right? Well, there's a big problem. And that's if you go to natural flood threat or flood impact potential, you press that button, red, right? So all of a sudden, you have this table visualized where, OK, we all look, you know, we're all kind of not doing so bad. But then you press this one button, and this super important, conflicted story dam is going to blow. It's going to blow. And you can actually show that to people. And then if you click on this guy, there are 30,000 people living in five kilometers underneath that dam. And almost 10,000 of them are below the poverty line. So suddenly you have this aha moment. And it's, it's, it's people, it's data, and it's red. right? And the only reason I found that was because there was one person in one Google group who had the same question I did, and there was one answer by this dude named like Stefan Jehovovich or something who said, oh, all you have to do is put the word feature in brackets in this one spot, and the whole thing will work. And like by the power of I don't know which deity was on watch that day, it did. But without that one dude in that one group, my map would not have worked. You just have to, you have to hunt. And this was my aha moment. And all of this is to say that you can't do it on your own. And that's the point. We're here as a community. That's the reason why people flew across from wherever to sit in this room and talk to each other. It's the reason why you get on the forums and answer questions when you should probably be going to bed. <laughs> you know, Because we're all in this together. And even though being a beginner in some respects is going to make you be like, ah, soft underbelly, that's OK. Because someone else, two years down the road, is going to come and ask you a question. And they're going to feel super vulnerable about it. And you'll be able to answer from more expertise personal experience, and you're going to be able to sit down with that person over a beverage and be like, you know, like when I tried this, it was like, oh my god. And you'll have that moment of community, and it's going to make all of this worth it. Okay. So when I say that you know, this is a talk about how to be a good beginner, I don't mean you're going to be the best beginner. I mean, this is how to be a beginner and be good to yourself. Because this process can be taxing. It can be kind of scary. You can feel super vulnerable when you're talking to a room full of people who know more than you do. And that's OK. And it's going to be awesome. And we're going to do it together. OK? Cool. Thanks. <laughs> if you have questions about maps or what?